Our speaker, David Frum, is here to explore rehabilitating or rebuilding after Putin's invasion of Ukraine. David is a senior, I probably don't even need to tell you this, but David is a senior editor at The Atlantic, a highly sought after political commentator. He has a great Twitter feed, I encourage you to follow him. And he's the best-selling author of 10 books, and I hear it on good authority, he's working on his 11th. David has deep Canadian roots. He is the son of the esteemed and greatly missed CBC journalist Barbara Frum, and the son-in-law of Peter Worthington, co-founder of the Toronto Sun, and a great champion of free press. David and his family have been part-time residents of Prince Edward County, our neighbors, since 1990. Our moderator tonight is Robin Ivory. Robin leads the economic development team at the Treasury Board Secretariat of Ontario. She earned an MA in Economics and International Relations from Johns Hopkins University in DC. Her generation has a lot at stake in the eventual aftermath of the war. So following David and Robin's discussion, we'll open the floor for your questions. There will be a microphone available and we'll try and find you and bring it to you. But for now, join me in welcoming David Frum and Robin Ivory. Working? Good. All right. I, I'm doing this wrong. <laughs> they look a lot easier than they are, I think. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, Barb, for that wonderful introduction. I am absolutely honored to be here this evening with David talking about the Ukraine Russian war. Sorry, I'm still <laughs> baffled by my headset. <laughs> we'll give him a moment. Yes, all right. Let me see if I can figure this out. It's like putting on mittens upside down. Like now, yeah. maybe I have it on the wrong? No, no, you're doing good? it right. You've done you it good? right somehow, but okay. I, I conspicuously failed. <laughs> the comic potential here is building. <laughs> All right, I think if that's, I was I think that's it. I, I was putting it on the wrong side of my head. That's cool. All right, thank you. Apologies. <laughs> we'll move on from that, and I won't yes, make too we'll much try of to routine. rise. <laughs> uh, so, our, our topic for this evening is rebuilding after Putin's war. This is a very forward-looking topic, uh, one that's kind of difficult to imagine right now in the midst of the war. And there are a thousand different possibilities and ways that this could play out. I'm hoping we can get to some of those scenarios a little bit later in the evening, uh, but for right now, I'd like to bring it a bit closer to home. As Canadians, we have many of our own issues. We're facing a housing crisis, potential for a recession, inflation, our own political woes, Global crises seem to pop up every morning in the news cycle. The list could go on. So my question to you, David, is do you believe that as Canadians, we are obligated to engage in the war and support Ukrainians in fighting off the Russian invaders? Yeah. Well, Robin, thank you. And thank you all for being here. And I'm, I'm so excited to hear that this is um, a return to normal after COVID. Um, I'm honored by the reception. I, I understand that normally to get a crowd as attentive as this, you have to bring the Stanley Cup with you. <laughs> I haven't done that, so, so I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, and your, your question is so, um, so to the point, uh, because there is this, there's this global crisis. Um, it's uh, threatening food and fuel across all the planet, not just in Europe. And here we are on the shores of this beautiful lake on this beautiful summer day in this peaceful and secure place. And it's natural to think, why should I care other than about the price of the pump? And anyway, what could I possibly do? So I want to start by, at Robin's guidance, answering those two questions as I see it, why you should care and, and what you can do. Um, we all live in this secure place because we are the beneficiaries of complex systems of law and understanding and peace and security that operate without any of us most of the time being aware of them. 
they just tick away in the background, um, bringing safety and security, uh, making sure that uh, you can use your credit card in Thailand and uh, have, the, have the account be honestly uh, debited from your, uh, from your bank account in Canada, uh, that you can tra uh, travel in safety and security, um, that goods arrive from all over the world, that you're at the end of these giant supply chains, and that the things you make and sell are available to all the world that wants to participate in the, these systems of commerce. It's an extraordinary achievement, and it's, been, um, it's grown up over a long time, but it's been especially developed since the end of the Second World War by people who knew what it was like when those systems break down, how much violence there can be, how much poverty, how much suffering. And um, those peop that generation, parents and grandparents of those of us in this room, um, they sacrificed a lot to build a different kind of world. And we're mostly inheritors of that world. But you know, there is no inheritance that doesn't require recommitment and maintenance. And, and that's what's at issue here. Um, that the reason Putin invaded Ukraine is not because Russia needed more real estate. If there's one thing that Russia does not lack, it is real estate. Uh, they, they, uh, and, they did, and they didn't care about these little provinces and these decaying uh, ancient industrial towns that made weapons for the so long gone Soviet war machine. What they saw was the possibility of people who spoke lang a language either like theirs, many of the people in Ukraine spoke Russian or a language similar to Russian, uh, who had shared important parts of their history, who are going to choose a, a different kind of life, who are going to integrate into Europe, who are going to become, build a stable democracy, who are going to join the system of collective security. And that was an intolerable threat, and that was why first Ukraine was invaded, and now Ukraine is being threatened with destruction just random violence, the de demolition of apartment buildings. Um, because there's an idea here that is, more, that is bigger than, um, than just the, the many millions of people who live on one side and another, the other side of the war. There's a, there's a big idea at stake. Now, I think you all understand this already. That's why you're here tonight. But there's this feeling of, well, powerlessness. What can, what can anybody do? Um, I mean, you can cast your votes, you can pay attention, you can follow the atrocity stories, you can, you can care, you can um, give money. Many people have done that generously, give money individually, give money collectively. Um, but I think there is also a, um, a kind of Canadian bashfulness that makes Canadians um, flinch from thinking very hard about the role their country can play in the world in, in a serious way. There are things that Canada can't do. Um, Canada, Ukraine has received very few weapons from Canada because Canada has not invested in having the weapons to share in a time of, of need. And that's something to reflect very soberly on. Why were those, mess why were those weapons not available to send? Uh, but Canada is a, a considerable economic, financial, and energy power. And uh, there is going to be, a, as we began by saying, there's going to be a colossal work of reconstruction mm -hmm. afterwards. Canadians can contribute to that. And Canadians can also contribute to the world, to the job of building energy security. Canada sits on top of vast energy resources. That is the thing that Russia has attacked to try to bring pressure on the whole world to abandon Ukraine. And Canada has a considerable role to play there. And we can talk more about that as the evening unfolds. Absolutely. I am questioning our uh, ability to support Ukraine after a recent decision by our government uh, providing the turbine back to the Russians to allow them to reopen the pipeline. This was a controversial, controversial decision. I'm wondering, why did Trudeau do this? Um, so it was mentioned that I have a Twitter feed, um, and my best friend and severest critic, uh, my wife, <laughs> mocked a recent tweet I had. I tweeted, um, Canadian turbine story more complicated than it seems. And she said, that may be one of the worst tweets <laughs> in the history. <laughs> She said, I'm, go I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight thinking about the possibility that the Canadian turbine story is more complicated than it seems. Uh, so um, Russia um, has compressed oil, uh, gas deliveries mm -hmm. to Europe. Um, many of you here w uh, are familiar with the way gas markets work. They're very different from oil markets. Uh, you get the oil out of the ground, you put it on a, a tanker or a pipeline, and you can move it anywhere in the world where there's a port. Uh, gas has to move along fixed routes. And when Europe, and especially Germany, made the fateful decision to be so dependent on Russia, it signed up for a very dangerous future. And that, that signature has gone bad. Um, and so Russia has cut uh, fuel deli gas deliveries to Europe by about 60% as compared to this time last year. Now, it's hot out in Europe. And this year is a particularly hot summer. Um, 
but what the Europeans do is they import much more gas than they need in the summer months. They store it in giant caverns underneath the ground or underneath um, the North Sea, and then they draw those reserves down in the winter. So when Russia slows the delivery of gas in the warm weather, that's an attempt to put its thumb on the arteries of Europe against the winter to make them more dependent when the weather turns cold. Um, Russia has, however, been reluctant to this point outright to violate gas contracts. Um, it, has, uh, it has stopped selling into the spot market, but it has continued to meet its uh, contractual obligations. Um, but it's got a number of loopholes, and one of the loopholes is um, that it can slow down its deliveries if it has maintenance issues. So to get the oil, the gas into a pipeline, you have to compress it and move it at the very ent point of entry. And that required certain turbines that were serviced in Canada. And one of those turbines came to Canada, and when it, when it was here being serviced, the Canadian government said, the sanctions regime may not allow us to send this turbine back. And the Russians said, that's great. That's our excuse. That's why we don't have to make good on our contract to send gas to Europe this summer. And so Canada made the decision to waive the, the sanctions, uh, at least this part, portion of the sanctions, and send the turbine back. What it was doing was saying to the Russians, you have to, you know, this is gas you mm -hmm. promised, you contracted to pay, um, or contracted to deliver. So I don't think that's, a, that's a, a breach. It was a complicated problem with many, but I, I think Canada made the right choice. Um, and indeed, just today, uh, after a 10-day hiatus, the um, gas began to flow again, although, again, at these slow and lowered rates that have a lot of ominous implications for Europe in the winter ahead. That's an interesting point, that it's going to have a lot of implications in the winter ahead. This war is likely to continue to be drawn out into the winter. Are Europeans going to fumble in their ability to support Ukraine if their oil reserves are being tapped to their fullest? You know, w one of the things that happens in peacetime uh, or in quiet times is that allies get to carp and cavil at each other. And the Europeans have complaints about the United States, and the United States has complaints about the Europeans, and Canadians have complaints about both, and then the, the Japanese being you know, with their own points of view. Um, and I think in this crisis, we all need to have understanding and sympathy for each other's contributions and difficulties. So it's, it's true that um, the countries of the EU have been much less generous with um, arms and uh, weapons of war than Great Britain and the United States. Um, and, but it's also true they've made considerable economic aid available, and it's also true that they are the people on the front lines who are going to suffer most. I mean, what is ahead for them this Europe? This, if this wi winter is severe, they had a test last winter. The, the Russians began to slow the deliveries of gas in the summer of 21. They knew war was coming in February of 20, uh, in, in February of 22, and they wanted to prevent the Europeans from having big reserves. Um, Europeans use gas not only to generate power, but to heat their homes um, and to cook their food and, and for many other uses as well. Um, so they created these artificial shortages, um, massive um, price increases, um, utilities had to be bailed out, consumers faced sky high prices, but last winter there was not an absolute shortage. But they continue, then, then the warm weather comes, mm -hmm. in fact it's too hot um, because of the climate crisis, which is part of the background of this story. And the Russians again are drawing, drawing down the supply, preventing the Europeans from stockpiling this summer. And that, and that means they are faced in the winter with absolute shortages, with yeah. genuinely not having uh, enough gas. Now, not having enough gas is a much worse problem than not having enough oil. If you don't have enough oil, um, well, you still have some. I'm supposing you, you're, you're, you're down by 20 or 25 percent. That's a pretty hard blow, but you still have some, and you can work out some system of rationing, or you, uh, you use prices, or somehow you know, make sure that the, only the highest priority uses mm -hmm. are met. Um, but gas flows through pipeline under pressure. And if there isn't enough gas, there isn't enough pressure, and the gas doesn't move at all. So you can have a shortfall that is, you know, a few tens of percent, a 10, 20 percent, 40 percent shortfall, but it can lead to a, a 100 percent shortage because the gas is unable to move. So you have to start closing off whole sections of the network um, in order to keep the pressure up in the sections that you continue to operate. So some people, are going to be faced with really serious hardship. Um, either uh, the uh, shutdown of economic activity where they are, or the risk of actually being cold and, having, and, and not being able to cook food in certain areas of cities and towns. So the, the Europeans are at risk. They haven't given the weapons, uh, they haven't given, given the know-how, they haven't always given the money, but they are taking risks that 
um, we need to be mindful of. Much, much bigger risks than anybody on this side of the Atlantic has to face. Absolutely. I want to go back to something you mentioned a little bit earlier in the conversation um, about you know, taking what we have for granted and um, building a global society that exists because of our democratic norms. Our democratic norms were threatened many years ago, and, well, many times over the years, but in 2014, Russia chose to invade Crimea. Yeah. And the global response was a little iffy. Yeah. Um, one of those reasons could be because the Europeans' reliance on oil and gas from Russia, but I'm wondering why did the world balk at being more aggressive towards Russia when they chose to invade the, the Crimea right. so many years ago? Well, um, uh, there, there were some fairly significant sanctions put in place after the Crimean invasion, but you're, you're right, it was not um, as serious response. Um, I think there were a number, I, I, I can't rank these in order of priority, but there are a number of reasons why the response was less forceful. First, the United States under President Obama believed that other things were higher priority. I mean, mm -hmm. working with the Russians, they're, 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 you have to, if you're going to contest them, you lose their cooperation in other areas. So Obama was very focused on the terrible war in Syria, which was generating um, hundreds of thousands of refugees. He was hoping to have Russian help in negotiating the nuclear deal with Iran, which was probably his highest priority uh, as president. Um, I think, uh, so those two, he chose other kinds of issues. Um, I think lurking in the background was a sense that many American policymakers had that um, the, the, the thing that triggered the invasion of Crimea was that uh, the Ukrainians heroically rose up and chased out this Russian stooge dictator with the famous house. Uh, I was in Ukraine just after that happened, and it was an inspiring moment. And I th I th the Russians then grabbed Crimea. I think there, there was a view in Obama's Washington that if the price of, detach of, of liberating Ukraine from its Russian stooge was the loss of Crimea, that was not a bad trade. After all, it was only an accident that uh, Ukraine was, that Crimea was in included in Ukraine rather than being part of Russia. The majority of the population there were ethnically Russian and spoke Russian. Russia had important equities and naval base in Ukraine, in Crimea. And so I, I, Obama may have had some sense that he was doing a deal. Okay, well let you have, you let us have, mm -hmm. the democratic world have the rest of Ukraine, you can keep Crimea, and anyway I'm focused on Syria and I'm trying to get Russia to help me with the Iran deal. One more thing that needs to be said, and because this just shows you how complicated these decisions can be. Remember, until uh, 2021, the United States had a very significant military presence in Afghanistan. Um, and that, uh, and Obama had raised that, I'm now going to forget, but he had had a big Afghanistan surge, and that surge had not yet been completely wound down in 2014. So I'm not going to remember, but there are still probably tens of thousands of Americans mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. Um, how do you supply? an American army in Afghanistan. And you remember, American armies need a lot of supplies. There are basically two answers. Uh, answer one is you put the supplies on truck. Uh, you send the supplies by sea to Karachi in Pakistan, unload them, put them on a truck, and drive them by road front through Pakistan into Afghanistan. Um, and that involves you in blackmail by Pakistan. Or the other answer is you send, you send them by ship to um, to Vladivostok or to, uh, to the Russian ports in Europe, and then you move them by rail through Russia, through the Central Asian republics, and into Afghanistan from the north. They're, they're, those are they're really only two answers. So, you're, you, so long as you have a big army in Afghanistan, you're dependent on either Pakistan or Russia or maybe both. And one of the things that Biden did, one of the reasons Biden was so determined to get the Americans out, and that was a very cold-blooded decision, and abandoned you know, we all saw the images. We know the Canadians are taking many refugees. I mean, um, women are not allowed in school anymore. They're not, they're, they're um, it's just a, it's a horror. But what the United States regained by that very tough decision was freedom of action against both Pakistan and Russia that it didn't have before because so long as your army was in Afghanistan, you, you were, tra your hand like Aesop's monkey clutching the nuts inside the vase was trapped inside the Afghanistan vase and at the mercy of either Russia or Pakistan or both. We are, we've been looking a little bit towards the past, but of course our topic for the evening is rebuilding Ukraine post-war. Um, I'm going to ask a very general question just because I think a lot of us are, are thinking this and wondering. What's your opinion on when the war will end and, and how could it end? Um, I, I'm not going to hazard a guess on that. Um, we all hope 
it ends soon, and we all hope it ends with the liberation of the conquered territories of, of Ukraine. But we have to be prepared for the fact that it could s stumble into a stalemate for a long time at um, a reduced level of violence, but at still considerable violence with, with a lot of human suffering. Um, but every war does end, every war must end, um, and so we need to start thinking about that now. And we need to reckon with just how big a problem this is going to be. And just as a way of, and I've been th think doing a lot of work on this and I've been obsessed with this issue. I, I am in no way a Russia expert, I have no way a Ukraine expert, and I have colleagues at the Atlantic who really are. So I leave um, that part of the story to them. But the part of the story I got interested in was uh, the reconstruction. When Eastern Germany was reunited with the West um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, that, that's, there were 17 million people living in, mm -hmm. in Eastern Germany. It cost about a trillion American dollars over the next decade and a bit uh, to reconstruct East Germany. Um, now, that money included things that Ukraine won't get. Uh, the, the East Germans instantly qualified for West German levels of pension. They instantly qualified for entry into the West Germany. They, they, for a much higher level of public, for the higher level of public services they have in West Germany, and nothing like that is going to be offered to Ukraine. Um, and, but the physical damage in East Germany was less. Things were dilapidated and run down, and some of the damage from the Second World War, if you visited Berlin, in the 80s, there were still parts, big parts, of the, cent the center of the city was still uh, fields of, I mean, it was no longer rubble, it had been cleaned up, it's still vacant fields um, where a city had once been. Um, so there was a lot of, um, so there, there was a lot to do, but you were not, you know, the bridges, there were, there were bridges, there were trains, um, there, there, there were functioning coal mills, I mean, with, that heavily polluted, but, there, um, but there, there, were, there were functioning industries that um, hadn't been smashed up. We're going to be dealing with a level of physical devastation. But understanding that, that um, wages and pensions and health care are all going to cost less in Ukraine, but that the physical devastation is much greater, and that, of course, this is, that it's a much bigger piece of territory with a much larger population. I think if you're thinking in the amounts of north of a trillion American dollars, uh, that gives you an idea, and that's a, that, you're getting into the biggest reconstruction pro project that the world has seen since the end of the Second World War. And that's one of the things I want to, one of the reasons I'm interested in talking to people tonight about this is it's pretty scary. It looks expensive, um, and it looks like a big sacrifice. And although the Canadian slice of it will be commensurate to the size of the Canadian economy, I think a lot of people in Canada are going to balk and say, what, what, um, yes, it's true, there are important ties of kinship between Ukraine and Canada, but still, I mean, really? Tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars far away to get up to this trillion dollar figure, and Ukraine is not a perfect country. There are stories of corruption, and you'll hear more of them. Why should we do this? And I want to communicate to people that as happened after the Second World War, you're going to get that money back. And a simple way to think about this is be before this recent violence started, um, the on the books economy of Ukraine, and there's a lot of Ukraine that's off the books, but the on the books was about 3,800 U.S. dollars a person, uh, which is astonishingly low for a European country. To put that in context, the on the books budget, or the economic activity in, in nearby Romania, we're not talking mm -hmm. about Northern Europe, in Romania, is about 14,000 U.S. dollars a person. If you, the reconstruction of Ukraine allows Ukraine to achieve Romanian standards of economic output, and that should not be impossible, you're talking about adding about a half, a, just there, a half a trillion dollars a year of output to the economy of the European zone. And those are your customers, those are your suppliers, those are um, those, uh, your competitors too, but uh, competitors who make you better. And just as we found that the, uh, the money given to Europe after the Second World War, and Canada, by the way, gave more proportionally than the United States did. In the famous Marshall Plan, the Canadian, there was a Canadian version. It, didn't get a snappy name, and the total amount was bigger, but relative to the economy of Canada, it was bigger than what the United States gave. No one missed it. Everyone, no one in 1960 felt, wow, we're missing a lot of money that we used to have in 1945. <laughs> Everyone felt, this is a better world. Uh, this is a better world, and, you know, and I've got, you know, I, I'm selling stuff uh, to bombed out countries, and I have, peop I have investors from bombed out countries, and, and we, these are now our partners, and we're now doing business together, and that is the possibility uh, that, that beckons. When you, when you lift up these parts of the world, you don't, the money comes back, um, and 
uh, as, uh, it, just as um, the Bible predicts, cast your bet, bread upon the waters, it comes back, and this money will come back. But that's going to be something that is going to be a tough, tough political argument when the moment comes to make that decision. We're talking a little bit about investments and uh, supporting Ukraine through providing trillions of dollars. One of the things that some people have mentioned we can do today to help is to forgive some of the debt. Yeah. Now, Ukraine has some serious debt servicing coming up. There are questions on whether or not they can meet their debt obligations. Currently, they're saying that they can, uh, but given the prospects of the war, it's possible they may yeah. have to default. Why isn't this being discussed more? Well, Ukraine did just get a, a debt pause from the, gr the group of lending countries. Um, I, I'm not an expert on this at all, but my understanding is it's pretty easy to pause debt owed by, from, uh, by government to government. But a lot of the money owed by Ukraine is owed to private institutions, private banks, uh, energy companies, um, people who uh, bought gas from Ukraine and didn't get it, maybe because Ukraine doesn't have much of the way of its own gas resources, but a lot of Russian gas used to flow through Ukraine. Um, and governments cannot say to private people, you know that, con that obligation you've got, forget it, or we're pausing it. Um, that's often illegal. I mean, in the, European, uh, uh, in the European Union it's illegal. I think in Canada it would be illegal for a government simply to, to, to pause that. Um, and uh, so it, that is something that has to be worked out. And one of the things that we, it may make more sense to do is instead of saying don't pay the interest on the debt, is just make sure they have enough money on the hand that they can pay the interest on the debt. Remember, Ukraine right now continues to operate pensions, healthcare systems, and other public services. And, much, and while you see these horrific images from the areas of violence, um, the, the largest city in the country, um, the capital, Kiev, is, is pretty peaceful most of the time. And people, you know, people continue to lead normal. You can go out to dinner, you can get an ice cream cone, uh, walk in the park. Um, it's, there, are, there are parts of the Ukrainian economy that are, are functioning, and it's really imp important to keep that going and to keep the services going. So I would worry less about squeezing the flow of debt obligations out and think more about enhancing the flow of financial support in. Another question I just have is, is regarding Russians' current movements in Ukraine. Um, you mentioned that Ukrainians living their daily lives are often able to go get ice cream out in the West. We're hearing stories now that that's actually becoming problematic because Russia is, is moving westward. Um, bombing civilian territories that previously were not involved in the war. What do you think the impact of Russian strategy is going to be on the rest of the country? It has a, a pretty big hold on the east end. Yeah. Do you think there's a possibility they're going to be able to get more power in the west? Um, what it looks like, and I'm no kind of military expert, but it looks like that um, when the mobile part of their war failed, that they're now trying, that they're, they're st present strategy has two parts. One is to squeeze the economies of Europe and, and the, all the world, Europe through f fuel, the rest of the world through food, um, to try to pressure uh, the world into abandoning Ukraine. And then the second part of the strategy is to use random terror uh, ag against uh, the Ukrainian people to break their nerve. Um, and the terror is becoming more random. Is also, they have no choice but making the t terror more random because they, they've run out of, it looks like, smart weapons. And they're using just now the stockpiles of old Soviet artillery shells, which are not very accurate and weren't intended to be accurate. So they just, they're just firing whatever they have um, from the, the vast inventories left over from the, you know, the, the massive arsenal of the Soviet Union. Um, so I don't think they're moving anywhere. I don't think they can. One of the things that has been uh, seen in this war is that the Russian army moves by train. It can't move by truck. And remember that famous convoy um, that broke down on the highway to Kiev. They, they moved by rail. And so um, they, they've got a World War I problem, which is, okay, you get the supplies to the end of the railway line, now how do you move them if you don't have sufficient trucks, and if the trucks aren't maintained, and if there isn't even enough gasoline for them? The Ukrainians are blowing up a lot of the Russian fuel depots with very accurate American and British missiles. Um, so I, I think it just, invo I think the, their, their strategy is smash, bash, and terrorize inside Ukraine, starve, um, try, to, or try to starve, try to drive up fuel prices, try to create recession outside Ukraine, and, ho and then hope for the best. I don't know that they have a, a much more concrete plan than that. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's as with Donald Trump's January 6th um, uh, project, um, it, it, uh, 
the nice fact that it's, for it, 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 it's the fact that it's not a good plan doesn't mean it's not a plan. And I hope it's an apt comparison in its level of failure. So. <laughs> You, you also mentioned Russian strategy in terms of creating a chokehold on the world supply chain, potentially yeah. causing a grain shortage, a recession. Yeah. Uh, there have been talks today uh, about signing a potential agreement between Ukraine and Russia to open the Black Sea back up to grain exports. Yeah. Uh, is there actual hope in that? Is Russia acting in good faith, or are we just seeing them try delay tactics? Well, th this is where the reconstruct a, a big part of the reconstruction project is going to be uh, trying to get railway, railway networks so that Ukraine's food can move to the world by railway to the ports of Western Europe. Um, and that's, that, that is a heavy undertaking because um, going back to um, before the First World War, uh, the old Tsarist Empire consciously made a decision to use, a, their, uh, you know, railway tracks come in different widths. Uh, before the First World War, most of Western Europe standardized on, on a certain width of railway tracks. So you could take a train from Lisbon all the way to the Russian border uh, without, uh, on the same railway tracks. The, the Imperial Russian authorities made a decision to have a different gauge as a way of isolating Russia from the, the rest of the world. And they thought of it partly as a, ter as a protectionist tariff barrier, but also as a security barrier. Um, and after the Soviet Revolution, the Soviets maintained uh, the same policy. And it was a, one of the factors in Hitler's defeat in his invasion in 1941 was that you, you, you could not easily put a German railway car uh, on a Russian railway track or a Soviet railway track, you had to you had to do a lot of engineering of the car. You have to change the car. You have to change the track, um, and so that inhibited the ability of the German army to supply itself when it invaded. That was the point of it. Well, the Russians and the Soviet the Soviets and then the Russians have never changed that. And Ukraine is still on the old Russian railway gauge. Um, so we need one of the th early things that's going to have to be done is to build railway networks for Ukraine that have European gauges, so you can begin to think about. Um, instead of moving the grain out by sea from the Black Sea, where it's subject to Russian terroristic attack and seizure, uh, to move it by rail into um, Europe, to Poland and Germany, where it can then move by ship from Polish and German, uh, German ports. Um, that, that's going to be part of it. But I, I think everyone should assume, I mean, there, you know, uh, it, I mean, Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, gives interviews every day in which he says these outrageous things. And you think, that, that we can see there's no good faith. Um, and uh, people. while well, every war must end, wars don't begin to end until the parties feel that their aims are no longer going to be met by violence. And I don't think that the Russian authorities have reached the point where they have despaired of achieving their aims by violence. I can't believe I've gone this long without asking a question about NATO, because that's uh, pretty topical. How will being part of NATO aid Ukraine in rebuilding its economy? Is there a linkage there? Are they going to receive extra supports? And, and what's, yeah. what's the timeline here for I, I don't. I, I doubt they're going to be part of NATO anytime soon. Um, uh, Sweden and Finland have just joined. Um, I, I personally hope to see Ireland join soon. Um, but Ukraine, is, it's not going to, because, look, Ukrainian is the American Express platinum card of alliances. So what you get when you, I mean, the dues are pretty heavy, but what you get is the, the American nuclear guarantee. Um, and it's hard to imagine the United States extending a nuclear guarantee to Ukraine before there's an agreement, some kind of agreed peace. But otherwise, the United States is entering into uh, an existing conflict and entering into it with a nuclear guarantee. That's a heavy thing to do. Um, the, the, the big hope for Ukraine is to get rapidly on the road to the European Union. They're not going to be able to join the European Union for a long time. Um, and Europe is going to have to make some important adjustments. I mean, Europe has a rule, for example, that if you, for new entrants into the European Union, you have to sign up to use the euro currency. And that's going to be a difficult thing for Ukraine to do. Um, so they're on, going to be on a track. But what they need is to be assured that their goods and services are going to move into Europe, into Europe that people can move back and forth freely, that Ukrainians have. And that, that's, you know, there's a lot of talk about resettling Ukrainian refugees in North America. And, um, you know, God knows uh, there's ample need for their considerable contributions. We have, my wife and I have three living in our house right now. But, um, but, it's going to be a, a very a different, no, 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 uh, it's just a fact. Um, but it's, uh, 
it's going to um, it's it's going to be a different thing to be a Ukrainian in Germany as of right, as a uh, as a candidate member of the European Union, than as a refugee in North America. Um, it's a you know being a refugee is is a deeply alienating experience. And if you can spare people that, say, no, you can just be, you can just be someone, a European who's mobile. You're, you're a European now, you're going to be mobile on your way. Uh, you, know, you go to Germany, you work there as, you know, uh, while you need to, and then you can return, and you, without feeling like you've said goodbye to Germany forever, you can come back whenever you want. Well, I did misspeak there, and that's why you are the expert. I didn't mean <laughs> the European Union and not NATO. However, NATO is playing a large role, as we can see, in, in you know, warding off Russia against potential future invasions. Uh, one of those potential future invasions that has caught the world's eye right now is going through Belarus and cutting off Estonia, yeah. Latvia, Slovenia. Is there any merit to that? Are we going to see more Russian aggression? Are we going to see more you know, large-scale invasions? Um, in, in, the, uh, summer of 20, in the spring of 2015, I took my son, Nathaniel, on a tour of the First World War front. Um, and one of the things that we, I was constantly trying to show him as we studied the First World War, because there's this idea that the people in the First World War were, were imbeciles um, and didn't know, couldn't, weren't as smart as us and couldn't see the things we see. And you have to understand that, that people in war sometimes face problems that they can't solve with the tools that they've got. Um, and when you see what is it like to fight a war by railway mm. without trucks, that means there are things you, that look feasible on the map that actually can't be done. And so a lot of it, that the Russian, because Russia is now so dependent on rail, um, they can't move armies around the way you can if you're playing Risk or some other board game. It's just they're, they're, uh, uh, that, that they are going to lose their ability to move. And that's why they're relying on just pounding and barraging and, and attacking and shooting. Because uh, is it, after you move people, you have to feed them. Um, so you don't have just, you, it doesn't just you move the army once, it's every day you have to bring a ton. Remember what I was saying about Afghanistan, I mean, the tons of supplies. And obviously Russian soldiers are not as well cared for um, as American and NATO soldiers. Uh, but they still need a lot of food, they need a lot of water, they need a lot of fuel, uh, and they need a lot of weaponry. Um, and if you don't have the wherewithal to move it, you can't do these things. So I, I think that part of the war is, is, I don't see a lot of future for it. I think what, what I see is a war terrorizing civilian populations. So let's say that Russia does lose, and the future of the war is that Ukrainians are victorious, they reclaim their land. What happens to Putin? Do you think there, that Russians will still support him, or is, is that going to be the end of, of Putin? Um, you know, I, you know may, may your words come true. Uh, that kind of, but that, I, it's, it's hard Some to optimism. imagine that kind of decisive victory. I, uh, the only way I can imagine a decisive Ukrainian victory is if there is some kind of domestic political collapse in Russia first. That is, it's not that Ukraine wins and then the Russian state collapses. The Russian state collapses and then Ukraine wins. Um, and that has been the pattern in many past Russian wars. I mean, I sometimes, you sometimes hear from, I, I tweeted something, this is more successful than my turbine tweet. Um, <laughs> but, but if you look at the history of Russian wars since the beginning of the 20th century, again and again you see the, a war, that wars lead, Russia has tended to lose and then to have political convulsions. 1905, um, when it fought Japan and um, had a terrible military defeat, and then there were, uh, there were uprisings across Russia that were ultimately crushed, but that forced the Tsar to concede some level of liberalization. Um, you know, the, the First World War, of course, ends in the Russian Revolution, the Soviet Revolution. Uh, they fight a war with Poland in 1920, and they lose, they lose that war, and again, the, the, the Russian Civil War gets um, the Reds do win in the end, but it intensifies the Russian Civil War. And so, so it goes. I mean, the, uh, the war in Afghanistan ends with the collapse of the Soviet state. Um, and not because the Russians were beaten on the Afghan battlefield, but because the, the cost of the war and the social damage. So I, I can imagine that happening. But I, I don't see uh, the, um, the outcome that would make the best story is often the one that is rarely the one that happens. I think it's more likely that this thing bogs down and we are into a world of stalemate and then some pretty ugly negotiations where some pretty unattractive concessions and compromises have to be contemplated. Well, I'm sorry to end on such a, 
<laughs> no, we got the audience. <laughs> we'll, end on, we'll end on a high note when the audience talks. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's time for audience Q and A. So I'll pass back yes. over to Barb. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to more discussion. Uh, if you have a question, um, just put up your hand. Somebody is going to come to you with a microphone, although I can't see them. And um, maybe keep your questions kind of brief so we can get through as many as possible. Uh, David will indulge us. Okay. There's one over there. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, thank you very much. Great insights. M much appreciated. It's a simple question, which is, why have these European companies or countries gotten into bed with the Russian bear and they wake up being bitten and they're surprised by it? Yeah. Um, it's a powerful question. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people in Europe right now are kicking themselves as they ask themselves that question. Um, the, uh, we're talking here especially about a generation of German leadership headed by Angela Merkel, but by no means her alone, who made this decision to rely on Russia as a supplier of gas. And I think the way that they thought about it was this, that Germany inherited from East Germany a very polluting um, industrial system. And not just carbon, but I mean, East German brown coal put all this, these cancerous substances in the air. So they wanted to move away from coal as, as fast as they could. Um, and after the uh, uh, nuclear accident in Japan in 2011, by bad luck, that happened to coincide with the, the lowest point in Merkel's popularity in all her many years in office. It had nothing to do with nuclear power. It had to do with the Euro crisis that was going on in 2010, 2011. But Merkel, by and large, had avoided tough political decisions through her career. Um, it frightened and upset her when her poll numbers dipped as low as they did in 2011. Then Fukushima happened. Um, there was a strong anti-nuclear movement in Germany. And by issuing the, pro the promise to end nu Germany's nuclear, civilian nuclear program, um, she could bid, and it, it did. Her, it, she, it was a very popular. Her poll numbers recovered. Um, and she went on to the rest of her long political career. Um, so they made those two decisions. How do you do that? Well, Americans had been pressing them for a long time as uh, natural gas in the United States and Canada has been coming in more and more into supply over the past decade, buy it from us. We're safe, we're reliable. You, you hear this message from Canadian politicians a lot. You know, we provide ethical, clean, and secure energy. But the Germans said, yeah, but your energy, your gas comes in liquid form. Uh, it, it has to be dug from wherever it comes in North America, moved through a pipeline to a port, compressed by a giant series of compressors, uh, into the point where it's liquid, and those, those plants are incredibly expensive, $5 billion typically, and then you put it on a ship and you bring it across the ocean, and then it comes to Germany, and then it has to be opened up again, decompressed, turned back from liquid into gas, and put into a pipeline. The Russian gas is way cheaper. Um, and we are going to gamble that the cheaper Russian gas um, is going to get us to the green future that we contemplate. And that turned out to be a fatefully terrible gamble. But even to this day, um, it's, it's one that they're sort of stuck with because um, if the, the way out is to invest more in getting new kinds of supplies, new kinds of suppliers, uh, getting more liquid natural gas, not only from North America, but the Middle East, who would have thought the day would we say is from safe and reliable suppliers like the, like the Middle East, yeah. but, but the Persian Gulf <laughs> is now, compared to some of the alternatives, um, a better one. Uh, and so that they, they've made these choices. I mean, I think. I think one of the rules, and I, it were, um, the reason politics is such a un fundamentally unromantic activity is uh, whenever you see a really big disaster, it was never done, it, it's very seldom that the big disaster was done for no reason or careless reasons. That people have powerful reasons, and they make bets, and the bets often turn out <coughs> wrong. Uh, but the bets, they didn't know that when they were making the bet, and that's how they made this bet. Thank you. I think there's a question in the middle. Oh, right there. Right. Hi. Um, do you think that uh, Ukraine's uh, resurgence or its rebuilding will be threatened if a Republican government uh, takes yeah. precedence in a couple of years, if there's a Republican president, for instance? Yeah. Uh, it's an ominous question. I mean, Donald Trump um, loved Putin and hated Ukraine uh, for a lot of reasons, some of them pretty obvious, some of them still kind of shadowy. 
Um, and pro-Trump Republicans um, have repeated a lot of his animus against Ukraine. Uh, the immediate question is the election of 2022, uh, where Republicans are poised to make gains, certainly in the House of Representatives and likely in the Senate as well. That's less worrying, because although there are a lot of backbench Republicans who are anti-Ukraine, the leadership of the Republican Party in House and Senate has been solid on the Ukraine issue, especially in the Senate, where Mitch McConnell visited Kyiv, he visited, he visited uh, Finland and Sweden and gave his personal guarantee that their applications to NATO would move fast through the Senate. Um, so I'm not so worried about that. But 2024 um, is, is a bigger worry. Uh, if, if Donald Trump somehow becomes president again, Ukraine may be the least of anybody's problems in that case. <laughs> well, not the least, but like not in the top three. Um, but if, I, I think their goose is cooked. If he's, he will betray them, and he's made that very clear. NATO's goose is cooked. He made it very clear. John Bolton told us this, that, uh, Ray, that, uh, uh, um, that President Trump, again, then President Trump, said if he's got a second term, he wants out of NATO. Uh, but even some of the more conventional candidates, um, Governor DeSantis of Florida, who looks at this point the likeliest second choice to Trump, has said nothing about Ukraine. Now, I, I don't think he shares Donald Trump's animus against Ukraine, but it's really strange that someone running for president has said nothing, and it's especially strange, because just before the Ukraine war broke out, there are a couple of hundred Americans in Ukraine on a training mission. Mm -hmm. American National Guard units, and those were Florida National Guard. Mm -hmm. So they came. So the governor. So you're the governor of Florida. You're thinking about running for president. You've had 200 of your state's National Guard in Ukraine until the day of the war starts. They're flown out of Ukraine back to the United States. You think you'd make a kind of a deal out of that? You know, meet them at the airport, say something about how proud you are of their service. Say, you know, you, maybe you want to be respectful of the prerogatives of the president and not get mixed up. But he said nothing, and he didn't meet with any of them. There are no photographs. And th that is an indication not of, I think, anti-Ukraine animus on his part, but of his awareness that, there, that Ukraine is very controversial inside the Republican Party. And the Repub many Republicans whose support he's going to need in the 23-24 contest um, are on the wrong side of this question. Thank you. Hello, so my question has to do with global institutions such as the United Nations, which was built on the League of Nations set up to stop aggressive wars. And they appeared impotent in this uh, invasion of Ukraine. What can you say about the credibility of such global institutions to meet their mandate? Well, we've built a lot of global institutions, and a lot of them look, work fantastically well. Um, and some don't. Um, and uh, that's just may, the, maybe, maybe the nature of institution building. And the United Nations is one that doesn't. It's always disappointed hopes, as the League of Nation, Nations, as you said, disappointed them before. Um, and I think we're, we're all going to have to learn to, and I think we have learned this, to reroute our hopes through other kinds of institutions. Um, the ideal of international cooperation remains livelier and more powerful than ever, um, and I think, I, I'm guessing as I look about this room that if not a majority, then many, many people in this room have children and grandchildren who are living and working in other countries and transiting freely, and certainly you, you all have friends in other countries, and there's a level of global interconnectedness that would have seemed incredible um, even, even before the advent of the internet, never mind a whole generation ago. But the UN didn't work out, and um, we need to focus on the, institution, uh, the institutions that, that do work. Uh, the European Union has worked, NATO has worked, and then there are just hundreds of other things that we don't pay any attention to. And when, when it comes time to build international arrangements to um, deal with climate change, we're gonna have to learn to make them look more like the institutions that do work and less like the United Nations, which doesn't. There's a question. Thank you for coming. Um, the, the war seems to be dragging on quite a bit, and Putin's using up a lot of weapons, a lot of, a lot of people, and he's busy scampering around to China and Iran and yeah. Turkey. Is there any credence in this thing developing into a kind of a proxy war? Like the, like the Spanish-American, not exactly like the Spanish-American war, but where everybody Special else gets involved with 
either weapons or people and the thing yeah. gets bigger that way. Well, I, I see what you mean. I, I think the phrase proxy war is not, not is, is pointing us in the wrong direction because a, a proxy war is one where there's kind of a war where both sides actually kind of want to fight the war for some reason of their own and they pick an area that is sort of isolated from, that protects them from direct conflict with one another, but allows them to test. And that's what happened in, in the Spanish Civil War. It became a way for um, the fascist powers to fight ultimately the Soviet Union, um, test weapons, test te techniques, te test ideology in a war that neither party was especially, both parties were glad to fight. Um, I don't think anything like that is going on in Ukraine. I mean, it is, we are, the, the Western world is indirectly involved through the flow of weapons and money. Um, but I, th I think no one, no one in the Western world wants this. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a proxy for anything. And no one wanted especially any conflict for Russia, with Russia. I mean, th the reason we're in this fix is actually because our, some of our most important allies in the world trusted Russia to be a reliable partner in energy security. Um, they, they were not, no one in Germany was looking for a quarrel with Russia. Uh, they, were, they were looking for enduring trade relationships on their way to their vision of a green energy future. Um, but we do have to make sure it, it is, it is um, it's going to be important to keep it contained. And that's going to be hard because the Russian, the Russian plan is you know, to make people suffer in Egypt. To make pe uh, Egypt is the largest wheat importer in the world. Um, they, they, they are going to suffer terribly through this. To make people suffer through Africa. Um, you, you, you saw, um, I mean, you've seen that, 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 uh, that organized African states are very reluctant to say anything on behalf of Ukraine. Um, they just see this, this is this, this explosion of violence that has nothing to do with them that is risking the stability of their institutions through, through food prices. Um, and uh, it's going to be important to try to deal with all of those problems and, and to take seriously the, uh, the food needs of Egypt and other countries. One of the, re one of the real villainous parts of this story I've written a lot about this for The Atlantic, is you, you probably have a vague, you know, you'll read these things about how Ukraine and Russia are, the, are at least huge wheat exporters together, a quarter of the world wheat market, and you'll say, I, I sort of have a recollection of the United States being a large wheat producer. What happened? And the answer was, in, in 2005, uh, the Bush administration, of which I was a part, um, in one of their less glorious moments, um, <laughs> passed a mandate that required that all fuel sold in the United States be made 10% out of ethanol derived from corn. Mm -hmm. uh, they created this completely artificial, protected, overpriced market for liquefied corn. And so the people who used to be the wheat farmers became corn farmers over the past. Century. So in, in, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, the United States alone supplied a quarter of the world's wheat exports, and now it supplies about, uh, about half that amount. Uh, well, one of the things that we can do as we think about feeding the world is to say, you know what? Um, we need to stop turning food into fuel, and we need to go back to set, gr growing it as, as, as food again, um, and making that available to, to feed a, a world that wants to have high and rising standards of consumption. David, you've got a really motivated audience here, so what do you, what do you want to have us take away that you want us to think or do to Thank build you. now? To, whatever, now and in the future, with what you're telling us? Um, thank you, that's a fantastic question. Um, and you're right, I, I came because there, there are things I want you to, to do, or I, I hope to ask you. Um, I think you need to stay, first, be um, responsible and reliable participants in the information marketplace. Um, I know you've all turned them off, so this is just a prop, but <laughs> uh, if you have one of these, you have more instantaneous video broadcast power than Walter Cronkite ever had. Use it wisely. Be careful what you read, be careful what you share. And I don't say that in a way like to cramp your style, but just, just understand there's a lot of stuff out there that isn't true. And, it does, and, and, and some of it comes from people whose motives are good. Um, and be careful, uh, so, uh, but also do your best to keep, in a responsible way, keep people you care about well informed and make them understand when, th when they're complaining about prices at the pump that they are part of, they are also on the receiving end of an act of global aggression. Um, and they need to understand that it's, it's not, that they are targets of, of this thing. That they're, and they're, they're suffering, and their, their economic pain, um, which is deeply, obviously important and powerful, but it, it's, it's also being used as a, res, it's a res, potentially a resource for somebody, and they need to understand that. 
Um, you need to uh, be mindful of Canada's potential, what Canada can and can't do in the world, um, and not to um, not to listen to people who present Canada as there's just nothing Canada says or does matters. Uh, Canada's um, uh, is a, an important participant in the world economy and world financial systems and world energy markets. You need to make, when you talk to members of parliament, when people come seek your vote, especially at the federal level, that these things matter. You need, uh, uh, I, I hope you will, when the time comes, and it's going to come soon, when uh, the cost of this project uh, is presented, to say, you know what, that, this looks like an investment worth making. This is not charity exactly. It is, it, in the very short run, it's going to feel like charity. Uh, but in the long run, it's going to come, come return to you. Um, uh, I hope we all come away with this with gratitude and appreciation for the world, for the interconnectedness of the world we live in. All these things that people have done together since 1945, and you know, it's it's, uh, it's real easy when you uh, look at all the human arrangements we've made. Think this is not as great as it could be, not as great as I wish it were. I can think of all kinds of ways it's defective. And to lose sight of, my God, you know, what a world we live in. What a world we live in. What things are possible. Um, how much wealth and freedom and security so many people have and, and, and how many more people have it than just had it as recently as the year 1990 and how many more people could have it again. Um, and I, I sometimes think, um, I, I wrote at the end of, uh, I've, I've, I wrote two books about Donald Trump, and one of them has a red cover and one of them has an orange cover. Um, <laughs> and uh, the red one is obviously the more alarming book written first, and the orange is the more reassuring book writ written second. Um, and, but in the red covered alarming book, I wrote at the end that there, there, there may be some sense in which there are some gifts of Trump if he makes you more appreciative of what you have and how important it is. And, and in the same way, I mean, the, the, look, this war is an unmitigated disaster. There's nothing good to say about it. It's just pure and unnecessary and utterly avoidable horror. But it has, among its consequences, if it makes us feel more grateful for what we have had and more determined to uphold it, um, even if it co seems to cost us some tax dollars in the short run. Great. I think we'll just take one more question, Paul. Hi. I wondered if you'd comment on the role of the oligarchs and the freezing of their assets, or just your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, uh, at, the, at the beginning of the war, there was a lot of talk that by squeezing the oligarchs, um, these very wealthy Russians who control important economic assets, we would change the political dynamic in Russia. And one of the things we've done is we've just conducted a um, live fire political science experiment, and we discovered it turns out the oligarchs don't have any power. <laughs> <laughs> they have a lot of wealth, but they don't have any power. Because if it were up to them, this, yeah, they, they would. They want their yachts back, and they want their their fun in the London disco back, and they they want their houses on Lake Como back. Um, I, and I'm sure there are a lot of people inwardly are thinking, for what? What? I, um, you know, the the. Um, uh, man who's called the Sean Hannity of Russia, he's like the most bombastic and propagandistic uh, person on Russian TV. He had two houses on Lake Como, uh, mm. near George, George Clooney's. And, uh, and the Italians lo locked them and then froze his bank account, and made it which made it impossible for him to pay his property taxes. Uh, and the result is he forfeited both the properties which have been auctioned off. Um, so how does he feel about that? Not too good, but he's, no, but he's not changing what he says on Russian TV because losing two houses on Lake Como is better than being in prison or dead. Um, and uh, so I think we've learned something about that. Um, in contrast, and if this is the final question, we've learned something about uh, the, the power of opinion in the democratic world. I mean, that one of the things that um, it's been amazing to see that, that Putin was really counting, he was counting on everyone to get demoralized. He was counting on people to see higher prices at the pump, higher prices at the grocery store, um, and say, you know what, this isn't worth it. I, 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 give me my cheap gas, gasoline. Give me my cheaper bread. Um, well, why, why is beef cost, costing so much? I, uh, because of some faraway war. And what he was, I think it's a, su a surprise to him how informed people have been. I mean, you're, you're here, you're talking about this country so far away, and I, I hope we all get a chance to see it again in peaceful times, and, or to, uh, but not everyone here, I'm sure, has, has, has seen it, and yet you care about, you recognize something of yourself there, and people are willing to bear sacrifices, and people care, and 
uh, people stay informed. And that has been an inspiring thing. And it is surprised, po and political leaders who have taken the right stance on Ukraine have, have found themselves rewarded for it. And political re leaders um, like some of the um, you know, more extremist parties in European politics have, have seen punishments. Um, so we, are, we have seen both the limits of political power in an authoritarian system like Russia, a kleptocratic system like Russia, and the potential for the power of the informed citizen here. And, and here you are tonight, and I'm honored to be with you because you would do such a thing. What, a, what an amazing thing it is that you, you would take time from your lives to think seriously tonight about people who are in violence and war so far away from us. Barb, Barb. Yes. I'm being inundated with people who want to have a question, and since I've used all the other parts of the room, <laughs> I'd like to have one question from this side. Are you okay with that, David? Sure. Excellent. Thank you. Um, you've talked about uh, the U.S. role in this conflict. You talked about the Canadian role. Can you make a comment about uh, China's role? Considering the fact that China itself is encroaching in the South China Sea yeah. on Thailand, on the Philippines, on Japan, where do they stand in this conflict? Yeah. Um, well, that's, a, that's an important point. I mean, I, in, in some ways, they're, they're, they're the next act. Because one of the things we're, one of the things we're testing um, is authoritarian systems look at the arguments of democratic countries and the rancor and all the hubbub um, and all the range of views that get expressed. And they look at that and they see that looks like a sign of weakness to us because we feel single-minded. We suppress those kinds of discussions. And I think there, there has been, especially because um, with the rapid growth of the Chinese economy and the apparent success of so many aspects of the Chinese model, I stress apparent, but the apparent success, um, they've, they, and they've developed this cult, this um, leader cult, they've developed this nationalist ideology, and they have been thinking the world was maybe ready to be remade by them. And I, I think that, you know, they're watching this and thinking, you know, just as Ukraine is a place where many people speak Russian and yet it has freedom, and that's scary to Russia, or the leaders of Russia, so the Chinese look at Taiwan and see a place where people speak Chinese. Um, and have a, de a democratic, a lively functioning democratic state and a rule of law and accountability, and, and that's a danger to them. And so they, they're thinking some of those same thoughts. Um, I think the, many people in the early weeks of the war wrote pretty casually about Russia, China bailing out Russia as an economic alternative um, to Western trading partners. I think we've seen that in that sense, China does not have a role. Um, it's not um, that as we move toward a world in which the, uh, Europe consumes less Russian gas, China's not going to be able to take it because the pipelines don't go in that direction and moving, building pipelines is going to be a huge undertaking that is going to be very costly and may not make sense. Um, but the, I think the Russians have been hoping that actors like China, actors like, as we saw from the recent trip, Iran can provide a, a, a substitute economic system for them. And uh, let's, let's hope that that Russian idea proves misplaced and that they discover that um, the Chinese are not going to save their bacon, and the Chinese may be learning some, some good lessons for everybody about the danger of aggression against sovereign democratic states. Thank you so much. This has been a fascinating discussion. We appreciate your erudition and your you know, perspective on, on all of these uh, wide-ranging questions. Um, and thank you, Robin, for advancing the discussion. As we follow the news, we can do so with a better grasp of history and, as you said, global interconnectedness. So if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, we have more great things in store for you on September the 29th in honor of National Day for Truth and Reconciliation or Reconciliation, NLC will present Dr. David McDonald, author of The Sleeping Giant Awakens. 
This will be in the Alderville Community Center and it is a, a free event, so we encourage you to um, support that. In October, we'll launch a full new series titled Borders and Walls. <laughs> Perhaps part of this Russian pale may come through in that discussion. You can find out more in the brochure that was on your seat or on our website. I also want to mention that Furby Books has your red book <laughs> downstairs in the lobby. It is signed by David, so I encourage you to pick up a copy as you um, go if you haven't already. And thank you again for being here. It's been a terrific evening. Nice to see all your faces, and thanks for supporting NLC. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for your video.